Hello everyone, if you just heard that then, um, you've not missed anything, we've just been having a chat before we got started. <laughs> We're just all really interested in the subject. Nothing <laughs> <laughs> to do with long. <laughs> <laughs> so are you letting people in now, Molly? Yeah. Yeah, people are in. arriving. Should we have a look and see where yeah, they've got 91 so far. <gasps> 91 people, crikey. <laughs> So just say 20, 91. 91. All right. Signed in so far that are listening to us yabbering on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where are you uh, from? Eggbeth? Eggbeth, yeah. Eggbeth? Sorry, pronunciation was <laughs> wrong there. Where else are you from, folks? Yeah, if you'd like to put in the chat box where you're watching us from tonight. My God. Girl in sale. Cumbria, Southport. Cold. Lunt. There you go. Oh, yes. Lunt, Crosby, Ainsdale. Oh, Bristol as well. Oh. <laughs> That's really nice. Oh, my goodness. It's gone berserk now. Berska, Omskirk, Mosley Hill. Red Squirrel Land. <laughs> that local red squirrel land or further afield red squirrel land Aberdeenshire wow Newtonley Willows that's really good gosh we've got a real spread haven't we tonight yeah how many people have we got so far Molly we've got 102 102 right I think We'll get started. Oh, there's Barry as well now. Uh, 103. Right, it'll probably slowly go up. Somebody's already submitted a question as well. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Let me have a look. I'll have to ask you. Okay. Right. Oh, well, no, oh, no, it's an answer more than a question. It's Julie Kershaw from Formby. Ah, <laughs> uh, Okay. Oh, someone else from, from Egbert. Right, we'll get started. It might slowly go up with numbers. Um, if you do miss anything, by the way, this will be up on YouTube afterwards. Um, so you can watch it again if you like. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, now, if you have got any questions tonight, um, you can put them in the chat and we have got the Q&A function available as well. Um, so I, my name's Molly and I'm from Lancashire Wildlife Trust and I am a communications and engagement officer for Lump Meadows. Um, with me tonight is Cheryl, who is our Lump Meadows project manager. Um, and we've also got Amy Gray-Jones and Barry Taylor, um, who are senior archeologists at the University of Chester. And we have also got Ron Cowell, who is the curator of prehistoric archeology span at the Museum of Liverpool. Um, so for those of you who are not so familiar with Lancashire Wildlife Trust, we are a nature conservation charity um, and we look after over 50 wildlife sites across Lancashire, Manchester and North Merseyside. Um, that goes from Brockholes in Preston over to Mearsands Wood in Rufford um, and Wharton Crag up in Silverdale in North Lancashire. And part of our work is to help connect people with nature and encourage others to care about the natural world so that we can protect it. Um, and over the last year, nature has been a real lifeline for many people. And we know that spending time in nature has a real impact on our well-being. Um, unfortunately, we are still limited with the events we're able to run at Lump Meadows um, and across all of our sites. So for now, we are delivering some sessions online like this one tonight. Um, and this talk tonight is part of our new Mesolithic and Modern Life project at Lump Meadows. Um, so it's a project supported by the National Heritage Lottery Fund to enable us to enrich people's understanding of Lump Meadows and the site's amazing heritage. And both the Museum of Liverpool and the University of Chester's History and Archaeology Department are partners um, with us on the project, along with Crosby Seroptimist International and the Environment Agency. Um, so tonight, Amy and Barry will be presenting first, uh, giving an overview of Mesolithic life. And then Ron will be talking more specifically about the discoveries at Lunt and a bit about the wider region as well. Um, so Cheryl and myself will be responding to questions and comments in the chat and in the Q&A function this evening, 
but we will also have time to answer questions at the end of the presentations too. So for now, I will hand over to Amy and Barry. Thanks very much, Molly. Um, I'll just get Barry, hopefully, to yep, share his screen, which is great. Um, and then I will just um, um, start off. Um, so we're going to give a little bit of background uh, to the Mesolithic, uh, which is the period of time that the archaeology at Lunt Meadows dates from. Um, and that term itself means Middle Stone Age. Um, so it's the period of time that spans about five and a half thousand years um, and that starts about eleven and a half thousand years ago just after the end of the last ice age and it ends about six thousand years ago um, in Britain and northern Europe and it's a period that predates farming and agriculture these appear in Britain at the end of the Mesolithic um, so people lived by hunting wild animals and gathering wild plants um, we don't have pottery um, in Britain at this time, and as this is the Stone Age, uh, there's no metal. We're still a few thousand years away from the introduction of metalworking technology. And so the landscape of Britain uh, was very different during the Mesolithic uh, to how it is today. Um, so to start with, it wasn't always, um, we weren't always an island. So at the start of the Mesolithic period, uh, sea levels were much, much lower than they are today. And much of what is now the North Sea would have been a low lying plain uh, that physically connected the British mainland to continental Europe. And you can see that um, on the map on the slide. Um, and gradually throughout the Mesolithic, sea levels rose and slowly this landmass was inundated um, and Britain became an island. Uh, but this took several thousand years. The landscape of Britain would have also been very different to what we're familiar with now. Um, much of the country was covered in areas of forest um, and there would have been large lakes um, and, and, and rivers surrounded by areas of marsh and swamp. And today most of these lakes and wetlands are gone, um, but they do still often survive in the names of places. Um, so where we have names like Nia or Moss, uh, these would have been wetlands and lakes in historical times that probably date all the way back uh, to the Mesolithic. The climate was also slightly different to today, so more akin to, say, the north of Europe with hotter summers um, and colder, wetter winters. And so I'll just hand over to Barry, hopefully. Hello. <laughs> hopefully that's, that's going through. Uh, yeah, so... Um... This landscape is populated by sort of large populations of wild animals. So some of these are species that we still see uh, in Britain today. So we have species like uh, red and roe deer, we've got wild boar, we've got foxes. Uh, there are beavers, such as those uh, recently introduced by the Wildlife Trust in Hatchmere in Cheshire. They'd have been common in the Mesolithic. There'd been lots of small mammals like pine martin, red squirrels, and a huge variety of different sort of uh, fish species and bird species. <clears throat> but the landscape is also populated by other species, which we're probably less familiar with today. They certainly aren't present in Britain um, today, but would have been relatively common in the Mesolithic. So if you're around in Britain during the Mesolithic, you would have encountered elk, or if you're from North America, uh, the moose. There would have been wolves in the landscape, and there would be bears. Um, and another animal, alive in the Mesolithic that we don't see uh, today is the aurochs. I don't have a picture of an aurochs because it, it's, it, um, it's extinct. Um, but at, at the time, it was a, a massive uh, prehistoric cattle. These were enormous species. Um, and what I have got on the slide there is a, a picture of um, a, an aurochs skull, which is the sort of the dark brown skull on the left, compared to a modern bull skull on the right. So you can see that an aurochs head is about twice the size of a modern bull. Uh, and cows are my, my least favourite animal. And so aurochs are my, my, my cow nightmare. Um, these are extraordinarily large, powerful and dangerous animals. Um, they, they persisted in, um, in parts of Central and Northern Europe for thousands of years after the Mesolithic. And Roman um, uh, legionary officers stationed in Germany during the, the time of the Roman period used to hunt them for prestige because they were known for their sort of um, uh, sort of fierceness. So people in the Mesolithic are sharing their world with, with a host of other animals, uh, including some uh, pretty fierce predators. 
Now, animals that you won't find in, uh, in the Mesolithic in Britain are farm animals. So as we've already said, farming and agriculture don't appear in Britain until the end of the Mesolithic. So there were no cows, uh, no sheep, no goats, no chickens, or any of those species that we're familiar with in the countryside today. There was one domesticated species of animal though that is around and um, some of you might have them in your house right at this moment. I'll just give you a second to see if anyone can guess what it might be. And yes, I'm pretty sure everyone got it. It's the dog. So dogs have been domesticated thousands of years before the Mesolithic. Um, and as in our society, dogs and humans had a very close bond. So they probably, they probably wouldn't have been pets in the way that we understand. They'd probably been, been working animals, maybe used in hunting and traction. But they still had a very, very close relationship with humans. And some uh, Mesolithic communities even buried dogs alongside people and even placed um, sort of uh, objects like grave goods in with them and, and the photo on the slide here on the right is from a Mesolithic cemetery in uh, Skatterholm in Sweden where we see these particularly rich lavish burials of, um, of dogs. Um, and the other animal that we would find in the Mesolithic were of course humans and I'll pass you over to Amy for those. Um, so Mesolithic people um, were the same species as us so if you took someone from the Mesolithic um, brought them to our time. There would be no obvious kind of physical or, or mental differences between us and Mesolithic people. Um, we know from DNA analysis um, that's, um, that's been done on kind of Mesolithic human bones um, that people probably had darker skin and probably dark hair, but with light coloured eyes. Um, but they'd be a very similar stature to us probably, but probably leaner and, and definitely a fair bit fitter um, than us. Um, they'd certainly be wearing clothes. Um, as we all know, Britain's not exactly warm and if you and you wouldn't fancy walking around the Lancashire countryside uh, in the nude during winter, then there's no reason to assume that Mesolithic people would have done that either. Um, we don't have uh, evidence for Mesolithic clothing itself, um, but we do know that they're skinning animals, um, and they're trapping species like beaver and marten uh, for their fur. Uh, so presumably they were using these materials amongst others in clothing. And what we do find as well are beads uh, made from animal teeth, uh, shells, even small pieces of shale um, that probably would have been stitched into clothing to decorate it. Um, and we also have evidence for bead necklaces and pendants, um, and in some cases, uh, headdresses, um, like, I think we have, a, do we have a slide for that one? Um, so people potentially using those in ritual activities or hunting activities. Um, so people lived in houses during the Mesolithic period. Um, Often I think there's a misconception people were sort of living in caves and weren't building their own structures, um, but they did use caves, um, probably as shelters and maybe as places for ritual activity, um, but generally speaking they lived outdoors um, in purpose-built structures. Um, and generally these houses had a wooden frame, they were probably covered with things like thatch um, from uh, reeds or other plant materials, um, animal skins, uh, bark, those kinds of materials used to cover the houses. Um, often reeds and rushes over the floor um, and they usually had a hearth or a fireplace um, and in some cases um, kind of raised platforms that people slept on. Now this might sound quite simple and rudimentary, but they were probably quite cosy um, houses. In fact, there are some accounts by yeah, European explorers in North America um, talking about how warm and comfortable these kinds of um, structures uh, were uh, and contrasting them with their own houses, in fact. Now these structures that we find aren't that big. Um, the biggest is probably about six meters across roughly. Uh, and we usually only find them on their own or, the, or in pairs. Um, so we think that Mesolithic people probably spent at least some of the time living in, in fairly small groups, perhaps extended families. Um, but there were times when people got together in, in larger groups. 
Um, so there's a site in North Yorkshire that um, Barry's been working on called Star Car, and that's a really large extended site, covers over a couple of hectares of land. Um, so a huge amount of animal bone um, and a kind of material that's been left behind from, from the activities there, so far larger than we'd normally expect um, at sites um, of this date of Mesothic sites. And so that seems to have been a place for perhaps communal gatherings where people came together, um, perhaps for feasts, perhaps at a certain time of the year. And it's likely that, as with us, um, people probably had different festivals and events marking particular times of the year um, where perhaps people gathered together in, in bigger groups. So in terms of what people ate, um, as we've already said, there's no farming or agriculture. So Mesolithic people lived by hunting wild animals, uh, fishing, fowling and collecting wild plants. Um, now, it's easy, easy to think of this as quite a simple and even primitive way of life. Um, but it's actually it actually required an incredible amount of skill to be able to do this successfully. The animals people hunted, um, well, obviously didn't want to be hunted. So they were very, they were very fast, they were very mobile, they would evade humans. They were also incredibly dangerous. I mean, if we take elk as an example, um, it's an animal that people were hunting very regularly in the Mesolithic. But these are huge animals and they're totally fearless. Uh, there's an account of a female elk uh, from a few years ago attacking a helicopter when it tried to land too close to her calf. They will fight anything that gets in their way. In fact, elk are the, uh, are the cause of more deaths than any other terrestrial herbivore in the northern hemisphere. That is your elk fact for the afternoon. Um, and if you're interested, the, the record for the world's most dangerous herbivore is the hippo, but we don't actually get them in Britain or in the Mesolithic. So there you go. Um, we can sort of reconstruct aspects of hunting in the Mesolithic um, by looking at um, some, of the, some of the forms of hunting technology that we find, but also by looking at the animal bones themselves, um, some of which contain uh, have injuries on them from, from hunts where they've been, been killed. Um, and here's a great example here on the screen. It's a complete skeleton of an aurochs um, that was discovered in a peat bog in Denmark. Um, the animal has been shot several times. Uh, there are projectiles found at various parts uh, embedded in around the ribs and around the, the rear quarters of the animal. So it's been shot with bows and arrows, probably fired at by multiple people, so groups of hunters. Now we think that the, what Mesolithic people would do would be to uh, try and target the heart or the lungs of, the, of an animal like this, which would mean a quick death. And this would mean getting very, very close up to the animal. But in the case of, of this auroch, uh, they've actually missed it. Um, they've injured it and then they've pursued the animal until it's become exhausted, at which point they've cornered it, it's faced off against them, and then they finally killed it, dispatching it with a spear which has been thrust through the animal, through the side of the animal, straight through its chest and then uh, through the other side of its uh, shoulder blade. So hunting is an incredible incredibly physical activity. It requires a huge amount of skill to stalk the animal, uh, to shoot it, and to pursue it and kill it without it turning around and um, having its own back on you. So who would take part in a hunt like this? Well, probably everyone. Um, older children would certainly be present, um, as that's how um, in hunter-gatherer societies children learn. They, ch they learn by participating. So as soon as they're old enough to be able to participate in these sorts of activities safely, then they will be accompanying adults on these hunts. There is an assumption that only men hunted, but there's absolutely no evidence for this. If we look at examples of um, hunter-gatherers living today, uh, gender roles in hunting are incredibly varied. Some societies have strict rules that prohibit women from hunting, but others don't. Some people will say that women didn't hunt in the Mesolithic because they weren't strong enough, and this is also uh, nonsense. There was a recent study on, on uh, the bones of both men and women from a slightly later period than the Mesolithic, though very close to it. And this study showed that the bone density of the women who, who, were, who were buried at these sites um, was the same as that of a modern female Olympic rower. So in other words, women in uh, the early prehistoric past were certainly strong enough to hunt, and there's no reason to suggest that they weren't going to be doing so in the Mesolithic. Okay, so now we can... Oh, I forgot that one. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> 
Uh, so now we can think a little bit about um, Mesolithic technology as well. So we often focus on, on stone tools when we think about the Stone Age, um, and these certainly were important. Um, and in this picture here, um, you can see uh, the characteristic stone tool for the Mesolithic, uh, which is called the microlith. So it's usually a small um, geometrically shaped um, piece of flint or stone, um, which would be set into a, a wooden or bone handle or haft um, and used to make things like knives or arrows. Um, and this image here is a really nice example uh, from Ron Holmes Mose in, in Sweden. Um, it's the broken tip of an arrow. Um, so you can see the wooden shaft, which is made from hazel. And there are a series of these white stone microliths set into a groove um, that's been carved into it. Um, and these are held in place using birch tar. Um, so tar from, um, from the birch tree. Um, but they also produced a huge variety of other tools out of stone. Uh, so blades for cutting, uh, drills and awls for making holes in things, um, scraping tools for working animal hides um, and plant materials and axes. Um, so as well as stone, uh, people were also making tools from bones um, and antler of the animals that they were killing. Um, and quite often these are used to make hunting tools like harpoon heads that you can see um, in this image here. Um, we also get kind of similar to stone tools, kind of projectile tips that would have been hafted onto arrows um, or spears as well. However, um, the most important material that people would have used uh, came from plants. So not only are plants likely to have been a staple source of um, food, um, but they're also uh, used in a huge array of different types of uh, technology and um, objects that people make. And if you want to get an idea of the variety of things um, that people would have made from plant materials, you just have to have a think of all the things that you've used today. So, I mean, obviously ignore the electronics and things with engines, but think about everything else, you know, the plates and the cups that you eat and drink from, the things that you're sitting on, containers that hold things, the bags you carry things in, rugs, blankets, your clothes. I'm working on the assumption here that everyone watching this is wearing clothes at the moment. Um, soap, glue, dyes, nappies, carriers for babies, skis, sledges, Anything you can imagine people using in the Mesolithic was made from plants. Um, and on the slide here, we've got um, uh, an absolutely beautiful fish trap. Um, it would originally been conical, but it's been flattened down by uh, sediments falling on it. <clears throat> Incredibly intricate working of sort of different types of plant materials. And these would have just been used in all aspects of people's lives. So far, I think we've, we've talked about uh, I suppose, aspects of people's life. You know, we've talked about their technology, their diets, a bit about what they, they look like and where they lived. But just like us, Mesolithic people's lives involved a lot more than this. They lived in a world that they understood. They had concepts of uh, life and death and potentially the afterlife. They had particular beliefs uh, that explained how the world works. And they had cultural values and rules that they followed. And I'll just pass you over to Amy for the, the burial section of this. OK, and I've just uh, switched over to a microphone, so hopefully that's a bit louder for people. As there was a comment in the chat, and apologies for any banging around if I forgot to mute myself and I was getting that out. Um, so, yes, thinking in terms of attitudes towards death, um, the Mesolithic is where we see the first evidence of areas kind of set aside for repeated burial. So what we think of as a cemetery, um, and that is groups of burials placed um, in and around settlement areas or elsewhere in the wider landscape. So in, in places like caves um, and <laughs> the slides already there, but um, there are going to be some human remains in these slides because I'm talking about death and burial. So just to make you aware of that. Um, and in terms of how the dead were treated, um, this slide kind of shows you some of the variety that we see. So we see both burial of the body shortly after death, what we call inhumation. Um, so that's the, the individual we can see on the left, but also cremation of the dead 
and then recovery and burial of the cremated remains. Um, and that's what that sort of rather enigmatic looking hole is at the bottom of the slide um, with the scale in it, um, an example of the kind of cremated bone fragments that we find in those kinds of features. Um, we're also seeing other practices like the exposure of the body to the elements um, and then the collection of the bones after the body's decayed. Um, so we find examples of individual bones um, like this arm bone on the right of the slide um, or collections of disarticulated bones um, deposited together in a similar range of places that we find burials. So places like caves or near settlements or on settlements um, at the edges of lakes. Some of these have cut marks on them, so perhaps they've been cleaned or deliberately disarticulated as part of burial practice um, as well. Um, and at the top middle of the slide there um, is a picture of um, a rare example of where we've found that human bones have been made into tools. So it's a, a barbed point that was um, recovered from dog land, from dredging. Um, and these are pretty rare, but perhaps those kinds of practices, making um, objects and materials um, from human bone, maybe that also formed part of remembering the dead in the Mesolithic. So a variety of, of ways of treating the dead, um, some of which we might not recognise as funerary practices today, um, and a range of different places uh, where the remains of the dead were finally deposited. So if we look at uh, some of the more formal burials as examples, and from left to right, you've got a burial here from Denmark, um, um, a double burial from Latvia, um, and a lovely re museum reconstruction of a couple of burials from Northern France. Um, and people had a range of objects um, included uh, with them uh, in the burials. Um, so, um, oh, I just lost my place there, sorry. Um, so, tools that we mentioned made from bone and stone that Barry mentioned. Um, so different types of animal bones as well, so bird bones, um, the bones from uh, small mammals, large mammals, fish bones, um, and also deer antler is a very frequently uh, found inclusion in burials. So you can see these large sets of deer antler underneath um, the burial on the left, just underneath the hips and, and the chest and arms, um, and you can see it around and above the, two bur uh, the burial on the, the right hand side as well. Um, so red deer antler is frequently found in burials um, and perhaps some of these objects um, so things like um, bone pendants uh, perforated shells are the remains of decorated clothing and jewelry that were perhaps worn on the body or in the hair um, so you can see in the middle picture um, these little yellow objects there amber beads um, that have um, been placed uh, with the dead um, and they're often they're found around the head and the neck and chest areas. Um, so the other thing that we often find are traces of red ochre in burials, so this kind of mineral red pigment um, and you can see that in the middle picture, you can see it in the picture of the burial itself and in the lovely kind of illustration drawing of, of that burial. Um, so perhaps rituals involved covering the body with this powder um, or perhaps it was applied to the skin or maybe it was impregnated in textiles and clothing. So we're not sure if this was just in death or perhaps this was something that had been applied to the skin or, or worn in clothing during life too. Now, if we look specifically at burial practice in Britain, um, we don't have very many large cemeteries or burials that survive um, in Britain. But we do have hints that we're seeing a similar range of burial practices um, in the British Mesolithic. Um, so one of our largest and earliest Mesolithic cemeteries was most probably um, in a cave called Aveline's Hole in Somerset. And that's the little reconstruction on the left of the slide. Um, and there's the, the entrance to the cave there in the greenery. Um, and there's evidence that perhaps up to 50 people were buried inside this cave. Um, and as we saw in those other examples, objects um, were very familiar, included with them, included um, perforated seashells um, and red ochre kind of strewn across the body as well. 
And there's a bit of a tradition of kind of cave burial um, that we see in uh, Somerset um, and the Cheddar Gorge. So a mile up the road in another cave called Goff's Cave um, was the burial that you might be familiar with of Cheddar Man. Um, and we, we saw this famous reconstruction come out of the Natural History Museum very recently. Um, but we do have um, examples of cremation burials. If you can just advance the slide uh, one more, there we go. So that's our cremation from um, an example of a cremation from Ireland. Um, and we do have a cremation burial from Langford um, in Essex as well. And this uh, little cremation pit that was discovered in Ireland, a site called Hermitage, um, has this wonderful um, polished stone adze that was included with it that looks like it was decommissioned, especially as part of the burial um, with this uh, cremated individual. Um, so a range of different practices um, going on. I'll hand over to Barry. Okay, so animals also seem to be been very important in Mesolithic culture. Um, in some cases, people made uh, representations of animals that they placed in graves or deposited into pools of water. Um, this object on the, on the uh, slide here is uh, what's called a red deer antler frontlet. Uh, it was recovered from the site of Star Car in North Yorkshire, and it's made from the frontal part of a, a red deer skull. It's perforated, it's had a holes drilled through it, presumably so it can be worn, and it's had the antlers reduced in size, again, to probably to make it lighter. And after it was used, it was deposited into a, a lake at the edge of the site, along with, with hundreds and hundreds of other objects, all made from red deer bones and antlers. So you have this large scale, very ritualized deposition of uh, specifically uh, red deer animal remains at the site. And this is a pattern that we find at other sites, not necessarily just focusing on red deer, but with other species, their remains being treated in a very, very careful and prescribed ways, and also people representing uh, animals in different types of media. And in other parts of Europe as well, people represent animals in different ways as well. So across um, northern Scandinavia in the Baltic, we have traditions of people carving uh, images of animals onto rock surfaces. We have uh, traditions of people carving elk's heads out of, um, uh, out of uh, wood and bone and antler and mounting them on staffs. And again, depositing these in very careful and ritually prescribed ways. So what's going on with this then? What does this tell us about sort of Mesolithic beliefs? Well, we know from the sort of the anthropological study <clears throat> of modern hunter gatherers that many hunter gatherer groups have a very different way of understanding the nature of animals to the way that we do. For many groups, uh, animals are thought to be uh, fully conscious and self-aware in exactly the same way that humans are. Animals have their own language, but they're also understood to, um, to possess the ability to understand human speech. They're fully aware of human actions, and importantly, they can be very offended by those actions. Animals can also um, possess supernatural powers. Some species, like bear, are, are understood to be able to move between different worlds. They can act as intermediaries between humans and other supernatural beings, and they can bring good luck, but they can also bring down bad luck or even death. Now, living in a world populated by powerful, sentient animals with supernatural powers does create a bit of a problem when you also want to kill and eat them. So for many hunter-gatherers, activities like hunting are seen as a negotiation between the hunter and their prey. So hunters have to follow strict rules regarding how the, how the hunt is carried out, how they have to dress themselves, how they prepare themselves for the hunt. There are rules around how the, way, the ways that animals are killed and how the remains are disposed of. And in return for carrying out these prescribed sort of acts, the animal will voluntarily give itself to the hunter. So it's not killed because it isn't quick enough or the humans were smarter. It's killed because it allows itself to be killed. However, if the hunter fails to follow these rules, then this can mean that the animals will refuse to, to allow themselves to be hunted 
Or if they're killed, it means that their spirits can come back and harm or even kill the hunters. And we think that when we find we see these finds in Mesolithic contexts, so these 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 ritual depositions of uh, antler frontlets and other animal remains, then we think this reflects something very similar in the Mesolithic, that animals in the Mesolithic were understood to possess certain powers or properties that meant their remains had to be treated in special ways, and rituals that required making objects in animal forms or depicting animals in art in order to communicate with these animals as a ways of mediating between the animals, the humans, and other powers in the world. And I think we'll we'll leave it there because I think we've run over slightly. Um, I don't want to cut into Ron's time. Um, oh, there you go. There's a nice picture of Red Deer. Um, but if you want to know more um, about the Mesolithic, um, Amy's just put together uh, this slide, which we'll put in the chat with a few nice sources uh, if you just want to learn more about the period. And like I say, we'll make that available properly uh, later. But um, thank you very much for listening and I'll just hand you back. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, thank you. That was fascinating. Brilliant. Right. So I am now going to share my screen to give Ron's presentation. Can everybody see that okay? Yeah. Right. Ready whenever you are, Ron. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, well, good evening, everybody. Um, uh, I'm, I suppose I'm the archaeologist that found the site at Lunt Meadows originally, and this is a, um, a slide from 2012 when um, we, we found it in the March and we started excavating the site in uh, the August of 2012. Um, and so I've been involved with saying this site for just getting on nearly 10 years, or it soon will be 10 years. Um, and during that time, uh, the, our attitude, I suppose, in the way that we could use the information that we were getting from the excavations and the analysis of, uh, of environmental samples and so on um, has changed. Um, over time and this uh, HLF um, scheme, the five-year scheme that we're just starting um, this year um, is really to build on um, what happened I suppose in the first five or six years uh, in that we've learned how to um, uh, present this information, how important it is, how it can be used. And what I wanted to do tonight, rather than go into the detail of, um, uh, of the, the archaeology itself in great detail, um, I mean, there will be opportunities for that over the, the coming months, um, as there will be also for uh, anybody who wants to get involved in any aspect of the work, the, uh, the archaeological work um, that's, uh, um, or even uh, the work with the uh, Wildlife Trust over the, um, over the coming five years, then this project really allows for people uh, to have that involvement at uh, you know, whatever level they would like. Um, and so what I'm going to do this evening, I suppose, is a bit more of the, the kind of philosophical background to why we think this site and this landscape is important. And essentially it's the pitch that we made to the Heritage Lottery people because they've given us a large amount of money um, for the five-year project, which will not just be for the archaeology, it will be for all aspects of the of the nature reserve. And so, obviously, if they're giving uh, a large sum of public money, then uh, they have to be convinced that it's going to be spent in the right way, with the right kind of benefits for uh, the local community or even further afield. Um, and so it's a kind of multifaceted project. Um, and to say people can plug into whatever aspect of it that they'd like to follow up or find themselves interested in or like or would like to get to know more of. Um, so I say this is more the 
um, I suppose this is the underlying principles of why we're doing this. Um, and I suppose the, the title there um, is, the, is the two major elements, I suppose. And these are intertwined. I mean, you know, one comes from the other. Um, and the, I mean, after, uh, from what uh, uh, Barry and Amy were saying, um, we've got a long period of 5,000 years or more of the Mesolithic period. Um, and during that time, over you know, centuries and millennia, um, there was a trend for um, changes in, uh, in climate, um, essentially. Um, to do with the retreat of the ice caps. I mean, it's it's quite a mind-boggling uh, thought to think that only 20,000 years ago, this area was under several hundred meters of ice. Um, and so the story of the last 20,000 years um, is of that ice retreating, uh, the land recovering, uh, and the climate changing in response to that. And again, they you would recognize elements that have become very big news, I suppose, over the last five or 10 years uh, to our modern ears in terms of sea level rise, um, increasing rainfall, um, water logging of uh, uh, the ground, uh, warming of the climate and, and so on. Um, and so Mesolithic people essentially say over generations and generations lived out those lives against these changing environments over uh, say over several thousand years um, and so that's one aspect that we can play up uh, or investigate or illustrate in terms of what has been happening at Lunt Meadows um, and the second, and I say very relevant to what's happening today, and I suppose that has been the defining principle, at least for me, in terms of trying to think about this. It's what, how can we learn about the past, uh, past landscapes um, in the most direct way? And the relevance to, if, if you can show a relevance to, um, today, today, the way we think about things, the way we interact with things, way, the way we're effect, affected um, by the natural environment or whatever, um, then that kind of forms this link with the past. And for me at Lump Meadows, you see that in so many different elements. Um, and I say it's been the defining principle for me, um, this um, uh, symmetry, I suppose, between what uh, was happening in the past um, and what is we're now starting to um, uh, witness in the present. And I say that goes way beyond climate as well. It also goes to our understanding of the past. And if we could have the next slide, please, uh, Molly. Um, and that, uh, I suppose, was the starting point, really, was that... Um, there are thousands of uh, Mesolithic sites known in Britain, um, but there's only really a handful of them that have been um, uh, found or recovered in a, a way that allows, in a preserved way, I suppose, because, you know, we're, we're looking back six, 10,000 years and a lot of uh, a lot of things will have happened to, on the whole, relatively flimsy sites over that period of time in terms of erosion and um, building developments and so on. So we know a lot of sites, but very few, where the evidence is relatively well preserved to give us an insight into how these people were, were living. And Lunt Meadows is one of those handful. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more later on, uh, which also comes back to the, the changing climate. Um, uh, but this was really the starting point that here, for the first time in over 7,000 years in 2012, I mean, not literally, but it was as if this site just kind of rose out of the ground um, in an area of land 
that up to 2012 had been farmland. And that farmland was being returned to a wild natural state um, in, the ter in terms of the Lunt Meadows Nature Reserve. Um, and specifically because we're right next to the River Alt, um, it's a, a wetland um, nature reserve. Uh, and so these two things, I mean, that it was the, the, the creation of the wetland reserve allowed this site to be found. And this site, as Barry and Amy have been explaining, is a site when, uh, of a period when people lived totally in the wild, um, thousands of years before uh, domesticated agriculture. Um, and so just a, as we in our modern um, day um, uh, landscape, um, changes, I suppose, in terms of what the Wildlife Trust wanted to do in terms of preservation of, uh, of flora and fauna and so on. Uh, this moved to a wild landscape. And here we have one of the, uh, the handful of sites preserved reasonably well within, um, within that area of landscape and the vegetation, the, uh, the surrounding landscape returned to something like what the people who were living there um, seven and a half, perhaps thousand years ago would have recognized as something that um, they would have moved around in, they would have got the resources from, they would have known intimately in terms of um, all the benefits that they could get from it. Um, and so those two aspects just kind of coinciding in, um, in 2012, it seemed that we could take this beyond just a purely academic rescue archeology, span which is what it started out as. We were just trying to find out what the site was before it was dug away as part of the reserve and then, uh, and then uh, flooded. Um, and then I say over the years, that, has a, um, that idea of preserving this site, of presenting it, of, uh, of, of making it a feature of the wildlife reserve so that when you go to the reserve to walk your dog for the fresh air, to see you know, vistas without buildings and cars and all the rest of it, you know, for your sort of mental and physical health, um, that you wouldn't just see this geographic landscape in front of you, of you know, the river and the, uh, uh, the fen uh, and the reeds and the woodlands and the sky and so on, but you'd also experience it through a, um, I suppose, a, there's a time element. You're also, it also gave you the opportunity to see this landscape going back through time. Um, and there was a certain point where it coincided, the two coincided, that people in the past, as I say, were living on this site that you can visit today um, with this landscape surrounding them that they would have recognized. And so that opens up all kinds of opportunities perhaps better than reading in books, a more direct experience of both a landscape and a way of life in an integrated um, setting, in its natural original setting. Um, and so that really has been the starting point, this kind of symmetry of, um, um, of almost the modern repeating the past. Um, uh, not exactly, but um, in terms of um, giving people uh, an appreciation of the landscape. Yes, that's the second half of, uh, of the talk. Um, and so, so as I say, that, that essentially is the, uh, uh, the essence of the, uh, of the principle behind this, this integratedness and this idea of coming full circle almost uh, in terms of experiencing it either from the archaeological point of view or the wildlife or the natural world or the environment or the climate or whatever. Um, and so we had a scheme between 2014 and 2017, uh, again funded by HLF, by the Heritage Lottery people. Um, and 
that was really, a, I suppose, a, a taste, a, a way of um, seeing how this bigger scheme could work. Um, and so uh, as part of that, as I say, we developed uh, our ideas for how we could use the archaeology. And as I say, this will be part of the future um, uh, public involvement, community involvement in, in, in the site in terms of, uh, um, of getting in, in the archaeology either just to learn about it or as you hear in a few slides time to actually become involved in some of the archaeological work that still needs um, doing so if we come to the second next slide please Molly um, and as I say I don't want to say too much about the um, uh, the archaeology I mean I say that's for another time um, other to say then that um, the, as I've already said, this is one of a handful of sites that has been preserved and essentially were um, 9,000, uh, actually on my screen, I can't see, you can't see the slide, but the two images at the bottom are about 9,300 years ago, uh, my recreation of what I think it was based on the archaeological evidence, and the one on the right, um, somewhere around about 9,100 years ago. And the plan at the top uh, there are several um, in area adjacent to the uh, Hopefully I didn't go out then, it said I was uh, unstable, my uh, network connection, but uh, um, uh, but the um, the, bu the buildings themselves, as I say, weren't in use. It's not like a long-lived settlement. This is a, uh, uh, a long-lived location, possibly over thousands of years, where groups of hunter-gatherers were moving in and moving out and moving back. Sometimes the site would probably be a for a while, um, they would come back. Uh, there may be the remnants of a building there that they would rebuild, or they may rebuild adjacent to it. And we've, I think, only got a small snapshot of a much larger area because this was the only area that we uh, that was being directly threatened and that we were able to excavate in. Um, uh, but one thing I do want to show you, I do want you to make note of, is that the reconstructions are of not of a wetland, but of a woodland environment. So 9,000 years ago, these people were living close to the river, but they were living in a wooded environment. And if you look on the plan, you can see all the patches of gray are the remnants of trees um, that have fallen over or look like being components of the, um, of the settlement itself, part of the structure of the site. Um, uh, and so that's a very important part of, uh, uh, I think, of the, you know, the, the, the nature of the, the settlement. Um, but to say, we have only 100 years of um, the 8,000, um, the 8,000, so what would be the ninth millennium for um, for a thousand years or so. But as I say, I think there there are other sites of that would fill that period in that we just haven't uh, had the chance to investigate. But if you look in the top, uh, top left of the slide, you'll see a long L-shaped white piece, um, which is a burnt tree. And we know they were around when that tree was burned because they put special deposits underneath the burnt tree. So they're still around, say, sort of around about 8,000 um, uh, uh, years ago. Um, but round, round about that time, 8,000 and the same after that, if we can go to the next slide, Molly. The next slide, please, Molly. Um, so as this, um, uh, things started to change, and this is the, the second part and relates to the question that uh, I was asked before, if it was lying, why wasn't it, um, why wasn't it flooded? The early stages, 9,000 years ago, sea level was 
enough for this island, but living close to the river, all the sites that we know of, this area are all within 100, 200 yards of the modern River Alt. So the river valley pull for people. And you go beyond about the three, four meter contour and all the archaeology stops. Um, seem, you know, they're very deliberate corridor of land that they're using uh, within this period. But going up to around 7,000 years ago, if we can go to the next slide, please, Amy. That's me, Amy, uh, Molly. Um, and again, this is a certain symmetry in terms of what's happening uh, both in the modern period and the past. Um, I mean, our intention has been to try and preserve this 9,000 year old settlement um, in a river valley at a time of worsening climate, uh, increased flooding. And so particularly over the last few years, this has started to happen quite regularly and the site gets flooded. And I think over the five years that we'll find that the story um, in, in terms of this uh, that we can um, perhaps, uh, or is that we can look at the, the, re the reserve um, gives a direct sort of uh, insight into will become more um, focused on the, on the flooding, both sort of in the present day. You can have a look on the next slide, please, Molly. In the past, because this picture, uh, again, of the site, um, and this is um, more like the situation round about seven, seven and a half thousand years ago, in that the trees had gone um, and the site was starting to flood. The surrounding vegetation was as we see it now today in the nature reserve. By now, as I say, we've gone over a couple of thousand years and sea level is, is much closer, much closer to where it is today, um, it's become warmer. And by about 7,000 years ago, we were at uh, what's called a, a climatic optimum, when it was warm and wet, as wet as it's been. Um, and you see all sorts of indications in the prehistoric record, but a particular one was a, quite a, a, sud well, a relatively sudden and large increase in the growth of alder, uh, which is a, 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 a wet, loving a wet ground loving tree and that starts taking over uh, from the earlier dryland hazel uh, oak woodlands as that becomes too wet for those um uh, and they kind of hire the the dry land. um this is um a, a say a, a relatively close uh indication of the uh, flooding of our site and that continued, let's say we can go on to the next slide, please, Molly. That continued uh, until the whole site became impossible to live on because of the flooding, the spread of the, um, uh, of the reed swamp uh, and the increasing uh, groundwater levels. And so what you're looking at here um, is essentially a vertical slice through the modern ground. So at the top of the slide, just outside the slide, you have the modern ground surface that the tractor would have been running over for the last 100 years or whatever. Um, so that top layer, the kind of very crumbly layer, is the modern topsoil. But underneath that are all prehistoric layers. And those prehistoric layers have resulted of wetland, um, as I say, uh, increasing high sea levels, increasing rainfall um, and waterlogging of ground and the spread of this uh, uh, reed swamp. Uh, just point out, please, Molly, at the very bottom of that slide. So this is the earliest. Um, there is more of the hunter-gatherer surface. So that's the floor of one of the buildings uh, or just have 
one of the buildings. And then if you look in the vertical section that we haven't cut away, but it's still surviving, you see at the bottom, there's a band of bright, uh, a bit lower, please, Molly, a bit lower there. That brown layer at the bottom is peat. And peat is um, a, uh, uh, essentially it's a, a deposit of only partially decomposed vegetation matter. And in that peat, there are the remains of reeds, you know, the, the, um, the, the, uh, the things that we finding in the day surrounding Land Reserve. Interestingly, some of those reeds, the prehistoric reeds, were burnt. So the people are still around, even though this site has, been, has um, become perhaps impossible to live on, they're still around because uh, it looks very, most likely they're burning the reeds on the edge of the wetland as the wetland is spreading ever, ever higher. Um, but you can see that's not only the only thing that has covered the site, because above that, there's a light blue layer of clay. Um, and but a very good, that on the site, but a mile away in Insblundell, we have a date round about 6,000 years ago for that clay. But that clay represents a totally different environment from the one represented by the peat. The peat is a freshwater reed swamp, but the clay has been is, is a marine environment. So all that uh, reed swamp, the freshwater disappears, and the whole valley is as if, if you know the uh, the, 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 the as far as Seft Church. Um, is under marine influence. Uh, so it's tidal and salt marshes growing over probably a thousand years or more. Um, and as that grow, as as that continues, okay, uh, as that continues, um, the deposits are getting higher and higher and higher. Um, and so as those deposits are getting higher and higher, it's covering our site and leading to its preservation. Um, because as I say, the um, plowing and draining and so on is getting down to those prehistoric levels. So even though it's flooded the, um, the site, made it impossible to live on, it has allowed um, that early settlement to survive. And, and that's really why um, the, the case, that we, we make for this site is because it has preservation that you will find on only a few other sites of this period. And then you can see at the very top, another brown layer and the sea level changes go or return, presumably out at the sort of the mouth of the modern day alt uh, may well have been um, blocked by sand dunes or something, and the marine influence ceases in this valley, in the Alt Valley. And so again, over centuries, it returns to a freshwater environment, and we then get a freshwater peat environment on top of the uh, what was a previous marine environment. So we haven't got a very good date for that, but um, I would guess from other evidence that we may well be looking at around about three to 4,000 years ago for that upper peak layer. Okay, we have the next slide, please, Mark. <coughs> and so it's not just this particular site that that happened, that we've got that evidence, but all the way across the reserve. And this is back to 2012 when the reserve was being created. Um, and you can see on the right hand side of the top left slide where the green is, that's the old, the farmer's crop that he didn't um, harvest that year. But on the left side where it's been scraped away, you've got that upper peat that I was just talking about. Uh, and you can see it stretching into the distance. Uh, sort of three, four thousand years ago. Um, below that, you can see um, the light blue. Could you just point that out, please, Molly? The cursor, that light, light grows of the marine clay that we could see upon our site. And then beneath that, under the water, which you can see on the bottom slide, again, is that initial freshwater clay that represents the first spread of. Um, uh, 
of this changing and, and wetland environment, um, say from round about seven and a half to 7,000 years ago. Um, and so, say we go to the next slide, please, Amy. Um, and so really it's those two elements that, um, and the interaction between them that um, allows us, I say, to make this case that if you want to learn about past environments, and how people um, uh, sort of were affected by them or uh, the kind of how they responded to changes and so on, then <clears throat> across the, um, the reserve, we have that evidence. And if you look at the right side, this is again, a sort of modern day real life evidence where I was showing you um, um, models of, uh, woodland and buildings before of 9,000 when the people were living in woodlands. Um, but there on the right hand side, you can see the trees, um, the seven, eight year, thousand, eight thousand year old trees um, that have been marked out on the, on the ground um, that have been flattened as uh, you can see they're lying within this area of peat, the brown layer. Um, so again, these are trees where the, 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 the groundwater is getting too wet for the trees to survive. The trees are falling over. The, uh, the reed swamp is taking over. Um, and so this is the process that I've, um, I, I've been talking about in action. And uh, if you look on the, the, the red, uh, the blue line, that leads from the um, uh, <coughs> um, from the slide to the the map shows you the the location um, and if you could just point out uh, on the slide Molly where the, um, the the our first site was that we were talking about yes down that's so down there and so each of the yellow dots was other sites of this Mesolithic period. Um, that we investigated during the creation of the um, uh, of, of the wetland reserve, um, and some of that material still has to be worked on. Um, you know, the soil samples with, um, and it'll have um, Mesolithic stone tools, burnt hazelnut, and so the, those um, and so we'll be processing. Um, and people will be able to get involved if they're interested in actually delivering um, evidence from the samples that we already have. Um, to say everything that we see in terms of um, uh, human aspect is surrounded by the context of vegetation of the landscape that these people were living in. And that, as I say, that kind of enhances the learning uh, aspect of it, the appreciation aspect, the archaeology, or the, um, or the vegetation. Um, and then I say, if we just think um, the final slide, which is just opening this out. If we just go to the final slide, please, Molly. Okay. And um, <clears throat> this is just um, to show that Lunt part is one is one end, I suppose, of this kind of buried prehistoric landscape that is present all across North Merseyside and West Lancashire. Um, and if you look at the, um, you can see where Lunt Meadows is marked on the um, on the slide, uh, and you can see it, it's on this green line, and that green line that runs through um, West Lancashire is effectively the edge of the wetland deposits. So everything to the left of that line over those um, several thousand years has the evidence of this changing sea, um, sea level of um, increase in rainfall, the change of environment, the change of vegetation, and it also sites of this period will be dotted throughout that landscape. And also, I just thought, um, um, again, it refers back to that question uh, where I said that the uh, in the early stages, sea level 
below um, uh, the people Lunt have been living quite a distance from the sea. For example, um, there's one at High, which is the upper one, uh, and hopefully you can see there on the present coast, on the present map uh, of the River Alt, uh, there's a, a true a prehistoric. Um, lead on a of um, dark deposits, which is the peat, and then that you can see the kind of slimy clay, which is the clay that we were talking about. So this is evidence that where we have seen today, previously was woodland stretching out, and it will go um, all the way out beyond Icy, um, depending on what period you're looking. At. How early you're looking at in terms of where sea level we have this very historic landscape going out kilometers out into the modern sea and so where we've just got the, end, the the sort of inland edge of that and the recent um, time of it and then someone is a picture of about 100 years ago both world the same thing and this is a woodland that is um to around about 8,000 years ago. Uh, again, you can see um, uh, on the, in the coast, on, on the um, washed away by the sea effectively in the, uh, the late 19th century. And so if we can just come back to the final slide, please. Uh, um, one more. And so, yeah, that really brings us back to today. And I, I mean, I say, I hope... Um, I've given you a flavor of, uh, of I think this is such, um, a project to learn about the past and the present um, in a sort of uh, almost like a real time environment uh, because um, you know we were the site, the whole site was flooded out only a few weeks ago uh, and you could down there. Um, and also not just to learn, but you'll also have chances to be involved in any aspect that um, that interests uh, you. So I hope um, I've done a reasonable job there as I did, with, or as we did, um, with HLF in trying to convince them that uh, this was an opportunity to spend money well in terms of um, showing people, teaching people uh, how to appreciate elements of their landscape and their history past that wouldn't have been available without this project um, getting off the ground. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. If there's anybody left. <laughs> there's uh, 95 people left, Ron. Sorry? I think, uh, 95 people uh, left listening to us, yeah. We only yeah. lost 200. <laughs> No, no, only a few. And that, I think that might have been due to... Um, ran over a bit. Uh, ran over Actually, a little bit, but also... I, I, sorry, I people's, question. Uh, no, no, it's not, it's not a problem. Time. Some people's internet was a bit up and down, I think, as well. We've got some questions, though. Right, well, well actually, I saw the first one, um, which was a question about, has anything been published? Um, and it has. Well, it's been editors for about two years I think now um, and we're told it's imminent but there is an interim report to about 2006 and we have to excavating every year so the info keeps improving every um, I say until the recent flooding of the last two or three years um, and uh, so yes it's um, th there's a, uh, a book which Council for British Archaeology are publishing, which is all about recent work on the Mesolithic. I think it's in the north, just in the northwest. And this, uh, the Meadows evidence, um, uh, is one of the chapters. Uh, but there's also um, work there from the island on a, another Mesolithic site, um, a site near uh, Kendall uh, that Lancaster University 
uh, sorry, Lancaster Archaeological Unit um, excavated um, and work really from all about the region, about the Mesolithic. Um, so if you can keep your eyes open for the Council for British Archaeology publications, and we would hope that that, it, that is imminent, so the editors tell us. Brilliant. Okay. <clears throat> Fascinating. I wanted to voice this one because um, I think Molly's answered it on the chat, but somebody has asked, and I'm not quite sure who Gigi is, um, but would they be Neanderthals or Homo sapiens or both? Who would like to answer that? Well, Amy dealt with that originally, so. Mm -hmm. Could you give us some sort of um, yeah, no, just uh, just Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, a little bit earlier than uh, the Mesolithic. Um, so just Homo sapiens happening in, uh, in the Mesolithic. Okay. Um, the first question that came in, I actually absolutely love. It's, did they cut their hair or burn it? I know um, Amy has answered this on the chat, but I just think other people will be interested as well. Um, so it was, did they cut their hair or burn it? As surely they didn't have long hair as it would be impractical. Yeah, and that's a really interesting question. Um, uh, maybe someone can correct me, but I don't think we have any direct evidence for Mesolithic hair or hairstyles. I'm trying to um, rack my brain. But um, certainly you'd be able to cut hair with the flint tools and the stone tools that um, we mentioned. Um, also the kind of cordage or string that you can make from plant materials or animal materials could be used to kind of tie hair back um, or things like that and the sort of braiding and that's used to make those kinds of materials could also have been um, applied to hair potentially um, and from some of the burial evidence um, those kind of perforated shells tooth pendants those kinds of things we think some of those may have been in people's hair as kind of decorative elements so perhaps as parts of part of braids and um and things like that so no direct evidence for hair but definitely um could be dealing and styling their hair in the mesolithic maybe if anybody would like to volunteer to have their hair cut with a flint we can turn it into an activity for the project <laughs> actually can, can i just throw something in that um hi can you hear me yes yeah. Um, uh, again, this is not from the archaeological evidence, but <clears throat> um, but archaeologists do use um, what's called ethnographic evidence from studies of hunter gatherers of the recent past, um, going back several hundred years in different parts of the world, um, and there's a lot of debate in that you probably um, use these examples on a, a kind of one-for-one -one basis that because it happened 300 years ago in North America, that it happened in prehistoric Britain or Lunt Meadows even. Um, but they do give, um, for me, quite fascinating um, kind of ideas um, about, uh, I suppose, the principles behind a hunter-gatherer way of life. And, for me, I, I've um, I, I've always been fascinated by um, Native American Indians and the way that they organise themselves. And and I've just kind of thought about this right, right just then. Um, but very often they would use hair as a way of signifying a kind of cultural or tribal or. Uh, you know, some kind of affiliation to a group in terms of whether they had it long, whether they had it shaved, and um, perhaps even what they um, included in their hair. Um, and uh, I mean, I, as I say, you can't, there's no archaeological proof that that happened. But for me, it, um, I wouldn't, well, there's any way of ever knowing, but I would, if there was a way of knowing, I wouldn't be surprised if it turned out that hair, and I mean, lots of other things as well, uh, I mean, can be the, the kind of stone tools that you use, the raw material that you use, um, that the, 
they go beyond the practical, you know, it's not just for keep, you know, you cut your hair to keep it out of your eyes or um, you, cut, you grow your hair to keep you warm or whatever, that there's something beyond that, that has a link with something beyond you that relates to your social or your cultural or your um, worldview kind of thing. And that these things are, are integrated and I say it wouldn't surprise me if aspects of clothing and the way you looked and the way you perhaps tattooed yourself or the way you smeared yourself in, you know, um, red ochre or whatever has something, you know, beyond the purely practical. Uh, and, and again, I, I mean, I just like thinking about it because it just makes that world so kind of, you know, the world of hunter gatherers so kind of vivid. You know, and so multifaceted, and um, I mean, we'll never be able to recover all of it. Um, but I say, just in terms of, um, of kind of adding um, a flesh to the bones, I, mean, I, I find it um, really intriguing and you know fabulous. Anyway, so we've got a few more questions. Thank, thank you, Ron, for that. Um, there was one that I kind of briefly answered because you touched on it, Ron, in the talk. Has there been any uh, link established between this site and the ancient footprints? Human, auric, wolf, etc., found on Formby Shore. Was there likely to be more than one such Mesolithic site in the area? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, yes. Um... Absolutely, there would be more than one site. And I say, if you if you saw that um, the slide that I showed of just of the sites in, within the nature reserve, um, that and we only looked at a small percentage of the area because there was only a small percentage being um, uh, being investigated or being developed by the environment agency. Um, we found, um, I think, about eight different sites, and they're not necessarily all of the same period, um, but other work that's been done um, throughout um, any particular uh, group, whether you know, it be a sort of extended family group or whatever, um, they're likely to have been moving around a landscape um, uh, at, potentially at various times of the years, very, being in different kind of environments at different times of the years when the resources were at their maximum for that period or that that place. And so there'll be a whole range of sites um, of different types for different groups of people. You know, some of them might only be for one or two people for um, a night or two, others like at Lunt, where we seem to have got much more of um, a sort of family groups staying there for a more extended period of time and a, a whole range of activities taking place there. Um, but there'll be a whole series of these sites and any one uh, potential group could leave in the landscape um, in any one year, a, a, you know, half a dozen different sites, and they could reuse some of those the following year, or they could not, they could go into a new area. And, and so gradually these sites are kind of spreading across the landscape. And in Merseyside and West Lancashire, um, it's these sites, these most flimsy um, uh, sites of, uh, of this hunter-gatherer period that are in fact the most numerous, that they're e relatively easiest to find um, because there are so many of them. Um, but to say, it, um, we are talking of fairly small populations at that time. And so they're generating over 5,000 years. Um, these groups of people moving around are generating a large number of sites. Um, so that is one of the tricks is to actually get a series of contemporary sites um, uh, and say that that is a big ask because it is a lot of work. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot the second part of the question, the footprints. Um, and at 9000 BC, we have, sorry, 9000 years ago, when the first people were, were there at Lunt, we have no evidence that or we haven't found the footprints um, that go with that period yet. They're later than that. Um, most of the most of the ones closest to the beach 
are um, probably 4,000 years later, 5,000 years later even, um, than the footprints. Um, but I do believe, and we were talking about this right at the very beginning, and I haven't seen the proper evidence, I've just had word of mouth, but there are some footprints now further out to sea um, that you can get when you know the tide's very low um, that are a bit closer to our dates of um, uh, 9,000 uh, to 8,000. And so I think there may well be some 8,000-year-old prints at, uh, on the beach now that have turned up. Um, and so that definitely could have been, uh, and if those are, that means that um, the coast is not much further out than Formby at the moment. And so our people at Lunt are only a few kilometers from the coast. Um, and so it's very feasible that, you know, people, who, I don't know, say they were at Lunt in the autumn, um, in the spring, may well have been leaving footprints on the beach at Formby. But again, I mean, you know, <laughs> we've no proof, but the, the logical implications of the evidence that we do have is that if we were lucky enough, we could find it. Uh, but again, that's a very big ask, but it is very likely. It's fascinating, isn't it, to think somebody that went on our site, on the Lump Meadows site, was also uh -huh. walking there across the the beach at Formby. Um, Amy or Barry, could you answer a question? Did did they use bone combs? <coughs> we don't have any bone combs. Um, they seem to come in later. They're more of a feature of metal using periods so from the Iron Age onwards. Um, uh I don't know. It certainly wouldn't be sort of beyond their their technologies. You'd be able to make one out of a out of a stone tool, I think, quite easily. Um, maybe not as easy as you could do with, with a metal saw, but there's, it's certainly within the scope of what they could do. But I have I can't think of anything that's that's bone that's comb like. And we do have if we look across across Europe and Western Russia, we've got ten, probably tens of thousands of bone and antler artifacts. But I can't think of anything that's that's comb-like, so no. I think, yeah, I think maybe the answer might be no for that case. <laughs> Unless anything's found to the contrary. Yeah. Um, can I got... ask Amy a question? Can I, I've got a question. Um, yeah. You know, on the burials, the slide with the burials, there was a couple of people in the same burial. Why two people? Is that does that mean that they were connected in some way in life? Do you think like it was a couple? Would there have been sort of that sort of arrangement in that time, or would it have been maybe siblings? Or that's a really interesting question. Um, it's always it's always I'm a sorry difficult... if it's unanswerable. <laughs> no, but it's it's a thing that we that does kind of pose questions when we find you know two people buried together um because obviously they in this case they died at a, a similar time because we can tell that from kind of the the juxtaposition of the burials um there hasn't been any you know direct evidence on those particular burials to look at their familial relationship but potentially you could look at that through dna analysis see if they were related um and you know, and sometimes people describe them as kind of family groupings. Um, so obviously there is that's all of those things are possible in terms of, you know, perhaps they were partners, perhaps they were part kin. Um, but in terms of we can't say for definite mm. and obviously we don't want to try to impose concepts like marriage, uh, you know, between one man and one woman um, into the past necessarily. We don't quite understand exactly what all those gender relationships mm. and uh, relationships would be between people in the past. Um, but it's a thing that we certainly then try and investigate through looking at grave goods and the types of burials and kind of how we see that pattern play out. Um, at a particular site or over time so yeah it's always an interesting question when there's more than one person um, in a burial. Um, off, off the back of that as well someone's also asked um, how long would they have lived? If you... That's a really good question too um, 
so I think there's a perception that people don't live, live as long in the past and certainly in the prehistoric past. Um, and that's partly to do with, you know, there being kind of higher risks in that there aren't doctors and people there to treat you if you get ill um, or if you get injured. Um, so obviously the kind of risk throughout your life is higher that you might die earlier than your sort of natural lifespan. But it's it's absolutely possible and we do have evidence of older individuals living um, in the Mesolithic. Um, it's probably just likely that not as many people as today say would live to those older age um, categories into those older age groups. Um, so it wasn't that short that lifespan was shorter, but that perhaps fewer people may have reached older um, ages um, in the past. But there's no reason people couldn't have lived into their 60s and 70s, etc. Um, it just kind of depends what happens to them in their life and how well they're looked after. Gosh, we've got so many questions coming through now. <laughs> should we say it, before we answer any more? Should we say at this point as well? We will um, have a another Zoom um, chat that'll be a bit more informal, um, which will be next Wednesday between twelve and one. Um, that's what we, we tend to do a one where we can see um, everybody on the screen then, and it's more of a more of a chat as well. So if your question does get answered now, um, we we'll send out the information for that too. Hopefully you can make it, or you can just email um, myself or Cheryl as well. I'll put our emails in the chat. It's going to be hard to answer all of the questions. <laughs> so I think possibly one for Ron. Should we call this the final one? Because it's half seven now, isn't it? Um, Ron, what is, this is from David Shaw, what is your favourite find from the site and what has been the most surprising? Um, well, I, I think my most favourite one was, if you remember back to what I was saying about the burnt tree that had fallen over, um, and actually this is linked to my most surprising as well, um, is that um, we haven't, on, on the site, we haven't just got evidence of where they were living, the, you know, the size of the buildings, uh, and we haven't just got evidence of the stone tools that they were using and, and so on, <clears throat> but we have got evidence of some of the things that Barry was talking about in terms of the way they would have interacted with the natural world, with the spirit world, you know, their worldview, the, how they saw the world and the animals and the landscape around them. And one aspect, and again, this is because the site has been so well preserved beneath all those um, burnt, um, uh, sorry, those, um, uh, those wetland deposits. Um, but we have evidence uh, and quite a few instances of um, uh, deposits that are not um, kind of everyday. They're not things that are just being tossed aside or dropped or lost. Um, there's a patterning that tells across the site uh, throughout, you know, both within the buildings and without the, uh, outside the buildings. And particularly, it seems, underneath trees, at the roots of trees, they seem to be a big focus, that they're putting these special deposits. And um, those special deposits are linked to um, a very distinctive um, softish, um, sparkly kind of granite. Um, and it's kind of, you can see all the, uh, all the, the sort of the, 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 the crystals on the surface of the granite and it gives it this kind of sparkling effect. Um, and also it's, um, um, the, these pebbles are also sort of impregnated with a with iron from the, the sand and the soil and the water, uh, they're kind of impregnated with an orange. So they're kind of like gold and silver when we found them. Um, and these, I say, have been put in places 
uh, on uh, the foot of trees, on little sandbanks. One of them was put under the burning, under the burnt tree. Um, and underneath that burnt tree, there was uh, a white flint blade. And we have about four pieces of white flint from the site. And one of them was this lovely uh, regular napped blade, which had been placed underneath the sparkly pebble, which was underneath the burnt tree. Um, and there was that kind of thing all over the place. And after that, after I started to kind of recognize that, um, I was on one part of the site and I saw, and I, I was digging around the edge of a building and um, there was a flat stone there about the size of your palm. Uh, had a slight kind of little dish in the, the top of it and it was just placed on the ground and I kind of knew before I lifted that stone there was going to be something underneath it um, and I just kind of lifted it up and there was there was uh, uh, two pieces of light blue flint um, directly under the, you know, and that kept happening. There was uh, um, there was another one where we lifted a big piece of granite out, and there was um, a piece of uh, black. Um, it's called chert, which is uh, too long to go into now. But if you get involved in the course uh, in the project, you'll hear a lot about chert, which is a form of flint. But this one was a black chert tool, um, and there are other chert pieces that to our eyes look special because they have veins of white running through them. Um, and again, <laughs> the biggest piece of chert, chert with the biggest piece of white crystal running through it was found underneath a stone on the edge of a pit. Um, and we, so we kept finding them all over the place. So, I mean, I, I've never really found anything like that. But after a while, I wouldn't say you got bored with it, but you could start thinking, oh, I wonder if that's one of these things. Um, and so, I mean, that was a sort of fabulous because it was kind of going beyond the everyday of, you know, keeping warm and keeping fed and uh, sheltered and so on. And it was something more about them as individuals in their own world and how they were reacting to it and how um i mean i mean these are in some form of symbolic acts you know they're, they're doing one thing to represent another relationship um and so i think that was the thing that i got the most um uh you know because i was it seemed as if you know we were kind of getting more into their minds than um uh, you know, and their everyday experiences and how they were expressing themselves in this kind of, uh, uh, kind of, you know, symbolic, I won't say ritualized way, but, you know, there, there's a degree of careful um, uh, presentation of these things in the ground. Um, and also what Amy mentioned before about the, um, the ochre on the burials um, in some of our pits, we had big slabs of red ochre um, uh, and I, we even had next to our largest and most elaborate deposit of, of, um, of, of stone, of, of granite, sparkly granite. Um, we had a long, all I can call it is a, a thick pencil of red ochre, which again had been placed in the mound alongside this, um, um, uh, sparkly granite, um, and so the, the say it was. I think it, it was that aspect that you know that's for me has just lifted this slightly out of the the normal with anything I've been involved with before. But it's not just doesn't happen. I mean, I mean Barry and Amy have dug sites in um, uh, in Yorkshire where the same kind of thing is happening. Um, so uh, so yes, and, and I say if. Uh, um, I say if you get involved, then you you know you will uh, in the project. Um, then you know there will be more scope for investigating this. And I should just say that when the museum opens in the middle of May, um, there is a display of artifacts from the site, and I've gone for one aspect of it is this um, you know you know this kind of um, ceremonial symbolic kind of activity and 
some of the you know the 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 granites and the ochre and the, the special deposits and so on um, uh, are on display there. So you'll be able to see what I'm talking about firsthand. Thank you, Ron. That's really good. <coughs> um, it kind of makes me want to become a volunteer again and get involved. <laughs> <laughs> project managing, but hey. Um, am I right in thinking, Ron, if uh, people want to have a look, because we've had a couple of questions about the AR app, so the Augmented Reality app. Um, if you go on our Lancashire Wildlife Trust website and you look on the Lunt page about specifically about Lunt Meadows, I think there's a link on there to the AR app. And also if people go on the Museum of Liverpool website, I think there should Although, be... Um, yeah, it, it has been recast in the last year. If you so, yeah. To recast so, it. Or, or get in touch with us and we can send you... Yeah, better to get in touch with me direct because I'm not sure what the website has anymore. Okay, all right then. So, um, yeah, thank you, everybody. That's been really, really yeah. nice. Thank you, every everyone who's stuck around as well. We've run over by 40 minutes, which is probably a record. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have had a record number of people, I think, actually log into this one. So, yeah, yeah. Archaeology One. There you go. <laughs> give, give us um, a couple of days for it to upload to YouTube as well, because it might take a long time. Yeah. <laughs> the size yeah. of the video. <laughs> the size of the video. And if anybody wants to join us next Wednesday between 12 and 1 for a chat, um, hopefully uh, Ron, Amy, Barry, um, you know, and myself and Molly will be there. So uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.